He longed to inhale the dust of the revolutionary generation of the 17, 1780s and 90s, along with its 19th century successors, adding that the somatic absorption of such a history was intimately related to the fact that the French catacombs were filled with the bones of the dead from the revolutionary period, and that in the French literary language in which Michelet was writing, the word poussière, dust, designated the remains of dead bodies rather than os, bones. Given that Duchamp himself preferred poussière, at a fundamental, this photograph is surely about male mourning. It functions as a response to the loss of countless men on the battlefields of Europe, a loss felt acutely by the Paris Dadaists, though rarely expressed by them directly. The archaicizing logic of the image, its flip from death to geometry, if you will, suggests a degree of male self-alienation, an inability to take in or deal empathetically with the overwhelming level of emotional intensity and loss involved, which itself possibly underpins Duchamp and Man Ray's reversion to miniaturization and to the game. This discussion of the coexistence of the active and negative registers of dust in the image suggests that it's high time we return finally to the refrain from the caption applied to the dust breeding photograph by the Dadaists. This is the domain of Eros et Selavi, how fertile it is, how arid. And to reflect on how this underlines all that has been said. Although it's hard to square Christian thought with either the Paris Dadaists or Duchamp, the title of the photograph, Dust Breeding, surely has vague connotations of resurrection and similar, and similar imagery percolates through the literature of the period. Eliot's The Wasteland, completed around the time Dust Breeding was produced, deals with a similarly weird mix of barrenness and the stirrings of new life. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land. And later, there I saw someone I knew and stopped him crying, Stetson, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? If at a certain level, the Paris Dada group seems to have understood Eroux Salavi in this redemptive way, which would accord with the exalted value they placed on women and the principle of love as means to earthly salvation. It's worth observing that a more ironic, deathly subtext had always accompanied Rose as far as Duchamp was concerned. Her first appearance in his work had been in Fresh Widow of 1920, where her name um, appeared with one R on the base of the miniaturized French windows produced at Duchamp's instigation by a New York carpenter. It seems likely that the war was obliquely at issue here, since the pun surely derives its impetus from a salacious nod to the sexual availability of newly widowed women in France in the years immediately following World War I. Rose may well have been a vehicle by which Duchamp mocked his French admirer's obsession with Eros. On the mock perfume bottle of April 1921, We can find this, yes. Um, arose in her first visual manifestation in the photograph collaboratively produced by Duchamp and Man Ray, is identified with um, eau de voilette or a veil water. And widows' veils are as likely to be at issue as brides. In 1921, Duchamp was to produce another work related to a uh, fresh widow, La Bagarre d'Austerlitz which is on the right there, the brawl at Austerlitz, which although generally understood to allude to the Gare d'Austerlitz in Paris, also throws up another deathly illusion, looking back beyond World War I to French involvement in the Battle of Austerlitz. So perhaps by the time the Paris Dada group published Dust Breeding in Literature in October 1922, Eros was intimately bound up with their attitudes to the war. What is even more interesting here is the fact that the publication of Dust Breeding was being prepared at precisely the moment that the French poets were entering into the so-called période des sommeils, 
the, trans the trans sessions aimed at elicitate, el eliciting unconscious messages, which had begun in late September 1922 and continued into, into early 1923, and which derived their basic modus operandi from mediumistic seances. Although in his essay on the trances, Entre des Médiums of November 1922, André Breton would refute the idea that, quote, any communication whatsoever can exist between the living and the dead, death was in fact a constant preoccupation of, the, of those involved in the trances. The poet Robert Desnos, who adopted the role of medium on those occasions, was frequently asked to predict when or how members of the group would die. During one of the sessions, Desnos supposedly received telepathic messages from Duchamp, to New, uh, from Duchamp in New York, in which Duchamp adopted the voice of Eros de Selavi. Uh, I selected this image here from uh, this picture book that André uh, Raffray produced, um, which is an attempt to picture one of these peculiar occasions with uh, Desnos there receiving his uh, telepathic messages from, from Duchamp. Revisiting the session in a text in Literature in December 1922, Breton would ask, who is dictating to the sleeping Desnos the sentences we will read and in which Eros Salavi is the heroine? Is uh, Desnos's brain joined as he claims to Duchamp's to the degree that Eros Salavi only speaks if Duchamp's eyes are open? There is a strong suggestion here that either Duchamp or Arose is acting as a medium. And Arose certainly appears to be mediating in a transatlantic communication between du uh, sur the Surrealists, or the, the uh, yeah, they were the Surrealists at this point, I suppose, I suppose and, and, and Duchamp, such that a voice almost literally becomes one from the other side. Seen in this light, and in relation to all that's been said so far, the caption applied to the dust breeding photograph in literature evokes the idea of Eros Selavi in a kind of mediumistic relation both to the war dead and the absent Marcel Duchamp. Interestingly, Hupov, in the essay on aerial photography uh, discussed earlier, notes that during the First World War, a cult of war pilots emerged such that the images of flying aces in the popular press had the effect of reconfiguring, quote, the empty space of aerial photog phot photography in terms of individual experience and collective mythology. This, of course, returns us to the sense of dust breeding as a battlefield and suggests the emergence out of this terrain of a rose as a form of compensatory collective image. In the final analysis, dust breeding appears to allegorize absence in various ways. As a photographic record, it shows only part of a larger work. On another level, the buildup of dust that it records is itself an agent of burial. On yet another level, understood as an aerial view, the photograph speaks of the absence of suffering from the imaging of modern war warfare. Most of all, though, the photograph allegorizes the absence of a person, Duchamp. It is in that sense a form of portrait, metaphorically akin to one of the spirit portraits that were so much in vogue among spiritualists early in the 20th century. It summons up Duchamp, raises him. But if Duchamp is eerily present in the dusty terrain presented to us in dust breeding, it is only insofar as this is also the domain of Eros de Selavi. Hence, this is a double portrayal of absence. Duchamp had invented Eros at some point in 1920 when, shuffling around his dusty bachelor's studio in New York, he presumably reflected on the limitations of his male persona, the need to reinvent himself. In giving her life out of dust, he envisaged himself as capable of a paradoxical male fertility in an age that had seen the men of his native France slaughtered in their millions. Okay, thank you.
Fascinating paper and a great example of how much can be mined out of one work. Uh, very impressive indeed. Um, sort of in support of what you said, uh, Max Ernst's uh, murdering airplane came to my mind yeah. also about aerial death. Yeah. And then the contrary thought that if there's any distinction between uh, sort of the victor side and the defeated side in terms of yeah. him being a German artist. Yes, yes. And um, in terms of the caption, we, I guess we would wonder if you could address the source of it at all, if there's anything known about that. And then um, um, in terms of children's songs, um, it seemed to me there were opposites, you know, fertile and arid. Uh, yeah. There were both, both, both uh, stanzas were opposites, which uh, uh, it rained all night the day I left. The weather was bone dry. I'm not sure about Stephen Foster's dates, but uh, that so just sort of a play of opposites um, okay. in itself. You know, yeah. how, how far do we go or how far do we focus on um, one part of that, mm. if that's a question. Yeah. But the, um, the, the, this is, uh, I don't, I don't uh, follow what you're just saying about the, this rhyme. What is this children's well, rhyme? Well, linguistic, uh, yeah, in, in American folk music, ah, there's right. the, uh, yeah. it rained all night the day I left, the weather was bone dry. Yeah, right. So sort of the dryness and the fertility or yeah. a play of language and a natural yeah. outcome. Well, yeah, I'm not sure that's relevant. Um, hmm. But uh, uh, as, far, as far as the, uh, the, the question about the, um, the, uh, the, the caption, where does it come from? I think that's a very interesting question. Um, it's uh, yeah, probably um, uh, Breton, but I mean, it's been suggested that it was Eluard actually that, that wrote it. But I'm, I, my argument there is really that uh, it's likely, I think, to be, to be Breton. Um, because of the, the play on the Oasis idea. Because in the first essay, which is the very first essay written on, on, on Duchamp by Breton, um, as I said, he, he, he talks of um, Duchamp as an oasis for those who are still searching, which I think you know, suggests that, that there was a play there on, on these ideas about you know, deserts and, and watering holes and so on. So that allows me to attribute that <laughs> to Breton, but, but um, uh, it's, it's not clear really who, who came up with it. I think, uh, you know, I mean, um, Man Ray may also have had his part to play in that. Um, and it's been suggested, as I've said, that um, it was Eluard. I can't really see it myself. There's no, you know, nobody's very clear about it. Though. But that's a, a fairly detailed reply, to, hopefully. Yeah. That, that answers that part of your question. But I mean, as to the other part, you know, the, the, the play on, I mean, if there is some kind of, you know, reference in some way to children's um, uh, songs or whatever, poems and things like that, then I guess that would fit very well, wouldn't it? Yeah, so thanks for that. David, I, I really love the way you unpack that photograph. I mean, I think that the title also, with its reference to happiness and sadness, suggests that it is an open-ended, multivalent image. Yeah. and. One thing that struck me, and it really was only after seeing so many Duchamp, you know, photographs of Duchamp and his studio in the exhibition and in today's sessions, was it's also a, a prefiguring of Duchamp's inactivity as an artist. This this idea that everything is yeah. just left left to dust, yeah. and mm -hmm. I I, th I think it counters what would become a kind of 20th century obsession with the artist in the studio yeah. through people like. Hugo Mulas and, and Alexander Lieberman, where mm -hmm. artists are, are sort of shown with the fruits of their labor. And the, the studios can be immaculately clean, as with, as with Mondrian, but with people like Brancusi, it's dust of a different kind. It's, it's mm -hmm. dust from work. Yes. This is all about a kind of um, you know, inactivity that brings in issues of, of boredom and things like that. I, yeah. I was wondering if you could mm -hmm. comment on that. Well, I think that's, that, yeah, that's a tremendous um, comment, I think. And, um, I mean, I agree. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, well, it was interesting to see, you know, I showed you that studio photograph with the uh, templates and things for the sieves, you know, and so on. So there was a sense in which that photograph had been a, a record in the sense of a kind of activity, you know. Yeah. So in that sense, it becomes a kind of... So it's what they photograph. cropped out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, so it's got that relation to, relationship to the studio in the context of the studio in a sense there. 
Yeah. And I like, yeah, what you're saying about lassitude is very, very important. Yeah. I mean, Duchamp talks, you know, in terms of the genesis of the glass, about periods when he was intensely bored, you know? Yeah. For me, the, the uh, uh, you know, so I think what you said is, is, is very, very relevant, you know. Um, um, and, and yes, yeah, certainly later on, um, uh, when, well, if you think about the rise of, of, a, of a new aesthetic in, in France in the, uh, the 1920s, it was a purism, which was, of course, very, you know, much the ascendant sort of movement alongside surrealism, so to speak, but in the kind of mid 1920s. Then, then you know, the, the thing was that the artist had to have this immaculate sort of studio, you know, and sort of get rid of the dust and all that. And, 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 yeah. and Duchamp is doing the opposite, obviously. So I, I, I think he must be, you know, there's a relation with that kind of discourse around the studio going on there. Yeah, you know? I think that's absolutely right. Um, but I, I, I don't know if it seemed to be in, implicit in what you were saying uh, some, in some part of your question, which um, I thought was very interesting, which is that. I mean, certainly for me, this, this, uh, this photograph is very poignant because of the, the absence of Duchamp. Right. And in relation to the, the, this exhibition and the things we've been talking about today, um, what, what, when I was reflecting on this paper before I did it today, I was thinking, yeah, what's interesting is the fact that, that Duchamp is, is absent. You know, he absents himself. Um, this is, you know, it's a portrait of pregnant with his, you know, it's an image pregnant with his, you know, presence in some, some kind of peculiar way. Yeah. But he withholds himself. Um, and that denial of self, which I actually find actually slightly disturbing. And Duchamp can take us into very disturbing areas, I think, of self-abnegation and such like. You know. Chimes in, I think, with the mournful nature of it. You know. yeah. I take it to be a very downbeat moment. Yeah. I agree. But, yeah. Quickly, that I think it's a wonderful reading of that, and the fact that Duchamp and Man Ray would think of this as an aerial landscape themselves, yeah. as it's, and that Man Ray would do that, does suggest that he certainly has some input in that caption. But in the notes, there are these references to airplanes and the war. So talking mm. about the bachelor's realm, that are things are yes. falling like the the bombs that aviators yes. drop, and then yeah. also there's this reference to the spangles. So right, a central area of the dust. Uh, as in the sieves, as being uh, losing their orientation, as in a derby, and that yeah. derby mm -hmm. refers to these airplane derbies that were contests for flying. You know, mm. so the yeah. the aerial landscape idea really is it fits with that, doesn't it? It fits yes, very nicely. nicely. Yes. Yeah. I hadn't really thought of that. So, that so it's not really a yeah. question, yeah. but more just a yes. more information on that. Topic. But then, of course, there is, I, uh, and this is something you've written about. I know the. Um, the relation to Leonardo and, and those those kind of landscapes that artists oh. can create by moving bits, yeah. things around that's on a table, dust and, right. and so that's on. So that's also a kind yeah. of you know. It's a great. Well, it's wonderful. I mean, I, miss, I didn't include that, but that's that's also there, isn't it? Yeah. Hi. I just thought I'd throw out one more thought about breeding. Mm. If we think of it as a noun separate from dust, uh, we have ideas about bloodlines and aristocracy. Um, oh, right. which certainly goes with a certain idea of Duchamp's uh, lassitude and uh, yes. grand removal yes. um, and also makes me think of elegant um, tradition and the individual talent, the idea of the artist sort of, you know, uh, pairing his fingernails removed from the, the scene of work. Yes. So uh, yes. if that's interesting or helpful, uh, there it is. Yeah, th thank you. That's, that's very relevant. Thanks. OK. okay. <laughs>